Hello, and welcome to another episode of Within Arm's Reach. I am your host, Jamie Jones. Welcome to the podcast where we talk to other cartoonists and comic book creators about the comic books that they keep within arm's reach to get them all jazzed about making comic books and such. Today, my guest is none other than Liana Cangas. Woo woo! <laughs> 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 Liana, this is normally the time where I introduce you and tell people about what books you've done, but other than, like, She Said Destroy, I don't know what I can talk about. <laughs> oh, yeah, since we talk all the time. Since we talk all the time, so I don't know what I can or cannot talk about, so I'm going to let you say what you do. Oh, hell yeah. Um, so I, the most recent thing that is going to be coming out is I did my first writing and co-writing with Joe Corallo for TKO. The artist on that is actually Paul Azaceda. That is going to be released later this year. It's called Seeds of Eden, the latest Guar comic. And I have a list up top, which is why I keep looking in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been published in 2000 AD for like Future Shocks and the uh, sci-fi specials and obviously she said destroyed by Vault and yeah I guess like technically that's all I can talk about. Um, you have a kick currently you have a Kickstarter. I am on a Kickstarter right now yeah that's true we were just talking about that so I am on the Inevitables Kickstarter which it's like a music and comic uh, grouping run. Uh, the comic writer for that is John O'Diener, who uh, he's a mutual friend of ours as well. And um, it's about uh, these 40 like uh, kids in Florida that are essentially trying to save the world. It's really cool. And that's new. So that just came out this past week. Oh. A little history of Liana and myself. We grew up 30 minutes away from each other. And never that is so wild. Um, on the on the east coast of Florida, and we met last year at Heroes Con. We were sat next to each other, and uh, come to find out, she grew up in Melbourne, which is very close to where I grew up. And we uh, bonded over that, and then we bonded over the fact that we know Vita and I. Friends that we know through Vita. Friends that we the know. Through Vita, and I was working on Quarter Killer at the time. So yeah, we hit it off very quick because that's what people of that area in Florida do. <laughs> we're, making, we're making up for like decades lost of time that we could have been like friends as teenagers. God, to have clear. one person who was like wanting to do comic books. And this segues perfectly into, uh, into uh, the, the topic at hand because enough about us. That's not what this podcast is about. That's true, yeah. Um, I want to know, what is the book that you read that you were like, oh, I want to make comics? Um, um, it's like one of two, maybe, just because like, one, I was like, oh, I love the art. And the other one was like, oh, I definitely want to do this. Um, Robin Year One was one of my favorite comics. And I forget when that was even published. Honestly, I've had multiple copies and have lent them out and never gotten them back. Actually, my current copy is sitting in California right now with a friend. Um, and then I think when I read the first phonogram was when I was like, I, that breaks my understanding of like conceptualized storytelling about different things. And that's, you know, it was like a comic that encompass like all of my personal interests, music and, you know, uh, Florida partying, you know, whatever, magic, weird shit. And so that was probably the breaking point where I was like, oh shit. Like, a, <laughs> you know, you have that drive, right? Like you have yeah. all these ideas all the time and then you're like, I could try it, you know, I could try it. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, didn't start reading comics until I was 17, really. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I talk about my uh, my break is pre-Eisner, post-Eisner is, is where I was. Uh, I was reading comics. I read The Goon, Sandman, and Fables was given to me as the first time as I walked into the comic shop. Oh my and, God, that's amazing. Um, 
and they really, they struck me and they formed what I was doing. And then I started reading superhero books. And then I started doing uh, submission samples for Marvel and DC. And then I think I was 23, 24, and I read a best co a collection of the best of the spirit. And I went, oh, comics. <laughs> this that is makes so much trying to do so, And then it just clicked. And I got really mad. And I got real, like, I just didn't know how to process it. It was too good for me to understand what, what was really happening. Yeah. And I didn't draw for like three months. And then full steam started going really hard in a different direction. So you're like, this is soul crushing. And then you use that to rebirth yourself and mm -hmm. begin drawing again. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, okay. it influenced and changed so much of how I, how I work. <laughs> I think I had that similar feeling when I had started reading. I think when Dark Horse was releasing single issues through like the Viz license stuff. So like, Oh My Goddess, Evangelion, um, things like that. That's yeah. when I was like, like, I want screen tones. I want to draw manga, blah, 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 you know, like freaking out because I like, I wanted to be at that level, you know what I mean, yeah. of storytelling. And like, I wanted to storytell, like whether it was like, I don't know, fan art of like other animes that I was watching or whatever, but like, that's when I knew. I think that those were some of the, actually the first single issues that I, I ever actually like purchased myself instead of like, you know, a hand-me-down or like garage sale pickup, but like bought myself from an anime store or the comic shop at the time. Mm -hmm. like, that was like such a long time ago. I don't even remember when it was. And that's primarily, I think, what got me into reading comics in general. And things like Infinite Vacation or like kind of like mental wall breaking reads is primarily what sets the tone of like why I continue to do what I do. Cause I'm like, I haven't quite hit that like rock yet of me wanting to affect somebody how I was affected reading some of those things, being like broken, you know? Yeah. And having yeah. to piece yourself back together. So let's go into what the, the task at hand, what the podcast is actually about. Uh, the books that you keep kind of close by to get jazzed about what you work on, on the work that you're currently working on. Um, okay, so part, can I also count original pages that I bought? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So um, next to, so the wall facing when I work, I have a piece by my favorite uh, woman artist currently, uh, Tula Lote. She has such a strong style that it speaks a lot to me. And so have to have her on my wall. Donnie Wynn, his work is very complex and like detailed and it's, a lot like I feel like I need to strive to like that level of complexities in my work. Uh, I have Nick Darrington stuff, some Ted Brandt and Rose Stein, Cliff Chang, um, Josh Hickson, the dude, um, and uh, a little bit of Daniel Warren Johnson, some Paul Azaceda, Robert Wilson. That's just on this wall. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I know like some of their, like some of them are newer creators and, but most of the pages that I've purchased are from books that have, I've connected in some way. And those are usually the ones that I like try to think of when I'm creating, I guess. I have some books by me underneath me, which I'm going to like look at real quick. Don't judge me. House of Secrets by DC. <laughs> like the old one. The old ones? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The old, old House of Secrets, like such a good, also I think Vault did a vintage cover of that one, which is pretty cool, but um, the line work by all of these guys was so incredible, and I love that they printed it on newsprint, but um, just it being in black and white, uh, you know, it gives me a lot, I struggle with putting blacks in my work, like, heavy ink and necessary shadowing. So this and it being horror, obviously, is like a big thing that... Yeah. Well, you work in primarily in color, right? You primarily color your own stuff. Yeah, you, most like, of the time. 
most yeah yeah i'm the same way and it's weird it's easy when you're penciling and inking a page to be like well i'm just not gonna i'll fill that in with yeah. color or it will be a color um but back in the day like no you you couldn't trust the colorist to fill it in the right color so that's true or like even really the right areas of what you're going for right you were, um, you were trained in that era to make the line work speak for itself and then because printing was is was and will never be as good as it is now right like it's yeah. printing is pretty great today back then it was horrible <laughs> yeah yeah but I mean, there's something to be said uh you know kind of i would like one day to do a book with some sort of i know rizzo is really in right now and rizzo is really cool but just like an old like newsprint book would be really fun. You know what I mean? I I do. <laughs> You're like, ah, yes, I'm already planning it. You're talking to the <laughs> person. <laughs> Some of the stuff that got me wanting to actually draw books specifically was, um, there was that whole run of 30 Days of Night. I, I think it was done digitally and I'm sure I'll be corrected. Uh, heinously on the internet for saying something wrong, but uh, it, it gave me this sort of idea because Ben Temple Smith's art is like um, what wouldn't be conventional for like big two or whatever, um, gave me this like sense of comfort knowing that I could go in with like if I had a style or like a specific way. And so like some of his books have been like on heavy, like rotation in terms of like what I would reread back in the day. I think a lot of stuff that I have for referencing when I am looking at, like I just need to come up with like a good panel like restructure or this feels too stiff so I want to change it around is I typically like flip through honestly like Emma Rios. I don't know if you've ever checked out her work but oh my god this is so beautiful and fluid and perfect that's a good one to flip through and uh you know re reading invincible for the first time to uh otley brian otley right oh i mean i can't believe how well the art is held up like it's so incredible so i think that's i mean in my current rotation right now so what do you get that. you you hit it all. i guess let's let's go with uh she said destroy right which is a very open style open line art colored beautifully colored underneath mm -hmm. kind of style what are you what are you looking at 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 that time when you're working on that kind of book which is like i get i understand otley at that point right like a very clean clean um really comic booky type type of line uh and i get like daniel warren johnson from that the kinetic that you're getting from there but what like this is me this let me let me preface this is me trying to dissect how you do stuff because it, <laughs> sometimes i look at it and i'm like i don't even know where she started or what she did um and, um, and how much you're playing around with different colors just just to play around and stumble into it which is something that we, it's just the opposite way I work, right? I'm very, I'm super mechanical in my, like, well, this goes here because I need foreground, midground, background every single time, and, you know? Oh my I, gosh, I wish I could work like that. Like when you were bringing up Otley, which now makes sense because I didn't even really think about that, was, um, like, I like Darwin Cook's work a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, like, a big one. Um, you know, obviously McKelvey being a, I'm trying to like, because I love books so much, it's hard to like think, okay, like going back to the original thing, but somebody did ask me about my line work recently and, or asked how, like which artists were an inspiration and how I like picked from them. And like Jim Mahfood was one of them. And I think like the breaking lines and stuff like that, trying to reference back to like who the artists that I liked a lot and then now seeing it 
I think that tends to gravitate more towards his like very kinetic, weird, kinetic, the word kinetic, the way I draw and like trying to like remove lines where it feels like they need to be removed or like just not quite finishing that point, right? Um, comes a lot from how, what's the word? I don't want to use the word boxy, very structural and like shape-like, mm -hmm. geometrically. I don't know, the way I approach colors is kind of like as if I was painting. And like most of the time I'll do an underpainting, but the majority of that time I already have inks done. And so when I go to color it, I just kind of, uh, it's weird because now I'm like, oh, I have a style now. I don't know how that style happens. I don't know how I execute it. I could not tell you, but it happens. The, um, the fact that you get anything done now, <laughs> it's, it blows my mind even more. It's like, yeah, I do an underpainting and then I have like colors and you're just kind of like figuring stuff out seems so bizarre to me. <laughs> You know, I feel like because I'm in this discovery phase of where my art is going as it is, I'm allowed to do that, you know, because yeah. before I hadn't really ever colored any of my work and I was just kind of like, mm, you know, whatever. But then when I started coloring the covers for She Said Destroy, I was like, they have to be perfect and I have no idea what that means. And I, you know, they have to be true to the characters and blah, blah, blah. And so... I think for colors, if I was to pick like a couple people, um, like Rico Renzi and Jen Bartel, their colors inspire me greatly. Um, and, you know, if you look at the old like juxtapose magazines with like the low brow, high brow, like graffiti art and stuff like that, they utilize a lot of those like punchy neon colors. And I like that a lot. Yeah. It's definitely like an aesthetic, like the vaporwave aesthetic or whatever. Um, it reminds me of like old school 90s hit em up animes. And so I think it works in my style. Yeah. Um, especially because it's like new and weird and fun. So it's super oh. awesome. <laughs> Hold on. I got to show you these artist editions that I got recently. Obviously, Paul is a huge inspiration to me, clearly, which is why I asked him to do The Seeds of Eden, but his uh, artist proof book. Yeah. Um, so I went to Comics University and this was one of the things that I wanted to buy. But like seeing his, seeing Paul's work at like full size, I'm like, dude, what the hell? So good. Um, and then I jokingly texted him and I was like, haha, what if I watercolored this and sent it to you? And he was like, what? Why would you do that? I was like, I don't know, I just feel like it. It would be so fun to color. I know that sounds ridiculous, but like, kind of like when colorists go to cons and like color originals, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, God, I love this. Seven to Eternity. I mean, just like the amount of complexity and like detail. Um, is it Opeña? And you can kind of see like the pencil markings and stuff in this one. Really yeah, yeah, I that's what I love about artist editions. The first artist edition I ever got was this one. Oh yes, and hell yeah! It's like incredible. Copic and ink washed and yeah, dude, it's incredible. It's incredible that he like. That's such a sparse, cartoony face. Mm -hmm. There's so much modeling. The silhouette of those characters are like among some of the best. And then I also have this one, which of is. Of course, you have to have that. It's, uh, so, what I really like is this is done at size, right? Yeah. The spirit was done double up. <laughs> so, it's. Uh, and you can like, you know. Just it, in, this is a 20 by 15 live area. Um, and it's just like. Oh my gosh. This is the size of my leg. 
I love that you're like struggling to hold it up to show it's me. Super, super. It looks gorgeous. massive. It looks it massive. Is. It is. I think like the heaviest book that I have that I reference a lot is the um, Amano, the Sky Final Fantasy art books, mm -hmm. where it comes with a, like multiple books in it. Um, I mean, oh, I think it was produced by Dark Horse. This thing's so heavy. literally a struggle to roll back but it comes with like the three hard covers on the inside this is like my favorite packaging that i've ever had for an artwork um and like it's such an unusual size because it's like that square you know but just to see like the sketches and stuff like that that they come up with and like everything collected whether or not it's used i think um especially like the watercolors oh my god can you even um i to answer your question earlier like i did flip through this for she said destroy um mostly not this one specifically but i think the third one maybe where there was a lot of character designs because i was trying yeah um, I was trying to like be inspired by like the color palettes and you know designs specifically to make something very fantasy space esque. So so good. Oh my god. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> to answer your question, thirteen minutes ago. Um, I, I will. I guess I'll say, hey, Liana, okay. thanks for being a guest on my show. Uh, where can people find you? Give me them hot links. Give me the follows. Uh, it is at Liana Kangas uh, everywhere, actually, including Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, uh, my website uh, at the dot coms, and. Uh, Follow TKO Studios for the announcement for the first thing that I'm co-writing. Follow uh, John O'Diener, the writer of The Inevitables, and everybody on that Kickstarter, which is live now for the next, you know, probably couple weeks. And keep an eye out on my Twitter for some new announcements, maybe. Yay. All right. Thank you so much for doing this, Liana. Dude, right. thank you. I. So You're amazing. Thanks for letting me just be like, I have makeup on. Let me on your show. <laughs>